to welcome Dr. Maria Shamina from the Tinder Centre, who's going to be our first speaker. And I hope Maria's going to be talking about, as it says here, a case for urgent and rad radical carbon emission reductions. <coughs> I'd like to start with the message of hope and to come up with a, with a few suggestions at the end on how we can deal with this challenge. There isn't a no climate change future. But what we can actually do is to affect the extent and the scale of climate change by our actions. Climate change globally has been put into um, a, an international, a global target, two degrees Celsius, and two quite radical statements, firstly consistent with science, and secondly on the basis of equity. So, so policymakers have committed to this and we need to hold them to it. The two degree C target here is taken as a threshold between acceptable and dangerous climate change. But in fact, already in 2009, there were studies that were saying the two degree C is a threshold between dangerous and very dangerous climate change. Let's look at some of the impacts of global two degree C. Widespread death of corals, increased risks of extreme weather events, increased water stress, and hundreds of millions of people suffering coastal flooding. So let's not pretend that 2 degrees C is particularly good. Many people around the world would die. They will be poor, and by and large, they will be a long way from here. We were starting in 1988, when this problem, the problem of climate change, already was established. Rio Plus 20, 20 uh, that took place in 2012. Many people, people think that Rio Plus 20 is Rio Plus 20 years. I think it's fair to say that it's Rio plus 20 billion tonnes of CO2. <laughs> because emissions keep rising despite all the exciting shindigs on climate change. That's our success so far. We recognise the problem and we've made it twice as bad as it was. And despite the economic downturn, the shaded area where you can see a little dip in emissions, um, despite the economic downturn, the emissions keep rising and the rate is currently about 2 to 3 percent. And we need to remember that's 2 to 3 percent from a very large number. So looking at this trend, we can say a few things about the future of the emissions. We know that we will not see any radical changes in the next two, three years. And the reason for that, one of the reasons for that, is the energy system lock-in, the infrastructural lock-in. Because everything we're doing now is locking us into a certain type of future, into a certain type of doing things. If you build a power station, a coal power station, nuclear, a wind park, it will be around for the next 25, 50 years. So it will be there creating, generating electricity for the next three to five decades. Large scale infrastructures, buildings, roads, sewage networks, transmission networks can be around for as long as 100 years. Many of the buildings that we'll be living in in 2050 are already built. If we think about ships and planes, uh, they last for about 30 years traditionally, and these are the two areas that the Tyndall Centre has been working on. Boeing 747 was commercially sold uh, in the 1960s, I think, and it's still around. Although there have been a few tweaks here and there, it's still pretty much the same plane. And you can't really retrofit planes. Uh, you cannot make them much more efficient because they are already highly efficient. So if the Airbus A380 follows the same path, it will be gracing our skies in 2070-2080. So this is the pathway that we're currently following, assuming mitigation policies that we're already implementing. So this is not a do-nothing scenario, this is a do-quite-a-lot scenario. Within mainstream scenarios, the, uh, we don't even look at extreme pathways like that. So the highest scenario that we're looking at currently is RCP 8.5 and it doesn't come close uh, to what we're following currently. The scenario that's higher will have more intense climate impacts than the RCP 8.5. Although you can see they cross in 2050 at approximately the same level, it's the cumulative emissions that matter. So the area under the curve, the build-up of emissions, they, they matter for the climate, not the level in 2050. The area under this curve is about 2,500 billion tonnes of CO2 out to 2050, and that's about 25 times higher than we're allowed to emit if we want to stay, if we want an outside chance of staying below 2 degrees C. So the current policy is leading us 
towards a low mitigation, high adaptation pathway. And this is in line with four to six degree temperature rise by 2100. We actually do to address, to meet this target. Look at the two curves. So the bottom one is the rhetoric, two degree C rhetoric, what we're promising to do. And the top one is what we're doing. The gap is enormous. So the question needs to be asked, how are we going to bridge this gap? How are we going to transition from the rhetoric to what we need to be doing right now? We talk about 2050, 2025, 2030, before low carbon supply technologies will significantly penetrate. The thing we can do now to reduce emissions dramatically is to reduce demand, reduce our energy consumption, particularly in the wealthier countries like the UK. If we take this seriously, we will not be driving home tonight, for example. We will be cycling or walking. We will not be flying on holidays. Next time we want to go on holiday. And we will not be switching off on our gas heaters, gas boilers, heating in the home until the temperature, dro temperature drops to about 17, 18 degrees. And because of this lock-in, uh, we require different, very different policy responses. So not only we need to roll out uh, the low-carbon low energy infrastructure, solar, solar, wind, and so on, but also address demand, behavior, and consumption. Is this feasible? Well, the orthodox view on 2 degrees C tells us that to keep global average temperature rise close to 2 degrees C, the UK must cut emissions by at least 80% by 2050. And we know now that 80% by 2050 is not quite science-based, because what matters is not the level in 2050, but the build-up of emissions uh, in between. But the good news is that reductions of that size are possible without sacrificing the benefits of economic growth and rising prosperity. So we could be swimming to work, but as long as there is economic growth, everything will be fine. <laughs> There's an alternative take on 2 degrees C, based on the same <coughs> science. Global, climate change is a global problem, so we have a global carbon budget to distribute among nations, and if we consider it appropriate to, for poorer nations to have enough emission budgets to develop and improve their welfare, so to let them consume more energy, and I, I, I expect that many, most of us would sign up under this statement because it would address the aspect of equity. In the same science, our conclusion is that dangerous climate change can only be avoided if economic growth is exchanged for a period of planned austerity within wealthier nations. But can, how can we have such different conclusions based on the same science? On the one hand, we've got the Committee on Climate Change, a group of really competent people who know their stuff, saying, <coughs> hey, we just need to do a few tweaks here and there, and we even get to keep economic growth. On the other hand, we've got us saying, hang on, we have to sacrifice our economic growth, at least in welfare countries, so that we can stay below the 2 degree C. We're comparing assumptions that we at Tyndall use for the designing, devising pathways, low carbon pathways, compared to what they assume in mainstream, typical 2 degrees C scenarios. Probability of exceeding 2 degrees C. We use a 37% probability, and many scenarios use up to 80% probability. So it's already approaching 3 degrees C, actually, because the probability of exceeding 2 degrees C is so high. I don't think it's reasonable to ex expect poorer people living in lower-lying parts of the southern hemisphere to put up with the sea level rise and the devastation it would bring them. What degree C is beyond adaptation? Of course, we'll model through in, in the wealthier nations, but people in the poorer nations, in the low latitudes, they would suffer, they would really struggle. What degree C is devastating to ecosystems? <coughs> and finally, what degree C is highly unlikely to be stable? Many analyses in this area do not take account of tipping points, discontinuities, and non-linearities. So when we talk about 4 degrees C, we might just as well have 5 and 6 degrees C temperature rise. So I think it's fair to say that 4 degrees C should be avoided at all costs. And then we need to ask ourselves, do we have the agency to implement those radical emission reductions that we need for 2 degrees C? I think there are a few things we can still do to show that 2 degrees C is possible. And the three, I'm going to touch on three of them. Equity, technology, with a focus, with a focus on demand and growth.
7 billion people on this planet, do we have to design mitigation policy for all of them? That 40 to 60 percent of emissions come from 1 to 5 percent of the population. And we know who the emitters are. Climate scientists, academics, anyone who gets on a plane once a year, <laughs> middle classes. So if we tailor the policies, mitigation policies, to people who emit most, we'll have a better chance to address mitigation, to address the equity aspect. One example for the UK would be a moratorium on airport expansion. Because that would affect people who fly, and poor people cannot even afford to fly. The aviation industry is the largest growing sector in terms of emissions, schematic of, uh, of the electricity system. And let's put some numbers on it. Uh, so if you use 10 units of electricity in your fridge, for your fridge, for example, or for lights, quite a lot of energy is wasted. Uh, an NA-rated fridge would, be, would it emit 40 to 60% more emissions than an A++ rate. Transmission and distribution, about 8% losses. Power stations, 35 to 55% efficient, and they're constrained by the laws of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics. And finally, you need to dig the fuel out of the ground, extract it, process it, transport it towards the power station. So you can see that if you do something at this end, refrigeration or light demand, then the energy savings will start scaling up across the energy system. There are units of electricity used at every point in the energy system, electricity system, when you're trying to consume energy. No, I'm still trying to, I think, like everybody else, I'm struggling with the figures. Are you telling us that for 10 units of electricity consumed in the fridge, the Earth is having to provide 133? Yes, that's right. And that's the ratio? That's right. That's absolutely phenomenal. It's very, economic growth is a very popular indicator with policymakers. But we actually don't care about growth. What we care about is better health and higher life expectancy high employment and income, equity, higher literacy rates, and lower crime rates, more time with family and friends. Think about the 350 billion pounds that we've given to bankers in quantitative easing. Joseph <coughs> Roundtree Foundation estimates that we need about 300 billion to retrofit the UK building stock to make it low carbon and resilient to climate change. So if we're allowed Instead of giving the money to the bankers, if we roll out a major programme that retrofits, that greens UK buildings and infrastructure, we could, we could address many of these meaningful indicators. Even without thinking about climate change, we could reduce fuel poverty, reduce energy bills, reduce vulnerability to volatile energy prices, provide mass skilled and semi-skilled employment as well as reduce emissions and prepare ourselves for a changing climate. The money is there to do the things we need. All we need is to the political will to redistribute this towards the, the right goals. To summarise, for 2 degree C mitigation we need a paradigm shift in the UK and throughout the world. We need to be honest about the time frame for 2 degree C budget. So what matters is the emissions in the next 5 to 15 years. We can't wait for some magic technology to come online in 2050 and reduce our, our emissions. We need to recognise the UK reduction rates and reduction rates in other wealthy countries should be at least 10% per year to give space to poorer nations to develop. We need to escape the dogma of finance um, as the principal mechanism for delivering to a degree C. And I've not spoken about it much, but it's about the inefficiency the inadequacy of the carbon, um, of the market-based mechanisms to address this issue. We need to acknowledge that we're not short of capital. We just need the initiative and courage to reallocate wealth. We know also that we should avoid 4 degrees C at all costs and that the UK and other wealthy nations should decarbonise by 70%, at least 70% over the next decade. Only a small percent of global population need radical mitigation, so we need to tailor our policies. A low carbon energy supply is not enough to deliver early emission reductions. So what we need to look at, look at is demand in the first place. And this will demand leadership, courage, innovative thinking, engaged teams and difficult choices. So this is my last, my final slide. And if you have any questions, feel free to email.
me or engage with my colleagues on Twitter. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>